The Shaman King world has been getting bigger and bigger. There's prequels, sequels, spin-offs and side stories turning that original series into this whole ecosystem of a greater story. It's these other series which we are going to be looking at today. The only ones we are not looking at are Funbari Poem and the newly announced Shaman King and a Garden. The former being too short and the latter that hasn't actually been released yet. So what are we looking at? Shaman King Zero, Marco's Red Crimson, Flowers and The Superstar. For each, covering both a quick synopsis of what each is about and then a quick discussion around its strengths and weaknesses. Overall, I think the sequels are a few steps short of outstanding. If you are a fan of the original, I would heartily recommend any of these series. Here's your warning though for spoilers. We're throwing caution to the wind and going full spoilers in this one. So if you'd rather read them first, please do. There is a pretty significant spoiler which you can't talk about the sequels without. If you're curious, read the first couple of chapters into Red Crimson and you'll be caught up. That being said, let's lay out today's menu. First things first, we're going to talk about Shaman King Zero as it's a prequel series and doesn't really have an effect on the sequels. Then a quick catch up on where the sequel series pick up, where the characters are and some of the big plot points. There's a lot of overlap in these series, meaning some stories talk about things that happen in the others, so getting a baseline catch up is going to help a lot if you haven't read them yet. Marcos is next, then looking at Red Crimson, then Flowers, then Superstar, then getting into Flowers Superstar a little bit deeper and looking at some of the ideas that they are looking to develop, some glowing praise and some fundamental flaws. And finally, to be fair, some issues that hold back the sequels from being as good as they could be. We're going to go pretty quick through those first few, spending most of the time on Flowers and Superstar and that discussion there, because they're really the mainline sequels and Flowers alone raises so much to talk about. Okay, let's address that elephant in the room. Some of these series are really hard to get English copies of at the moment. Kadansha is saying that there will be digital English releases before the end of the year, so fingers crossed that actually happens. America, explain! Explain! What do you mean in Arkansas? This is what I've read, and this is what this video will be based on. All of Shaman King's heroes. Marco's up to chapter 5, Red Crimson to chapter 7, all of Shaman King flowers, and then Superstar up to chapter 14. Let's crack in. And what percent is that? Zero. Zero's a percent. Zero is a collection of short stories based around the main Shaman King cast. There's a story for Yo, Ren, Horo, Lyserk, Hal's Buddies, Mapadoji, and Sati, each unrelated beside Yo and Ren's. If you're a fan of the original series, this is basically recommended reading and is great development for all of the characters. Zero plugs some of those holes that the main series ending has. I think Horo's story is the best one, so let's use that as an example. This develops his relationship with Tomoko, or Damoko, and deals with both their relationship before and after she dies. In the ending, this is developed too quickly and this is exactly the support that Horo's story needed. The story covers their friendship, they go on a cute wee date, and then it deals with the fallout of her death. These become quite possibly my favourite pages in all of Shaman King sequels included. Horo talks to Tomoko at the top of the dam, which is not only metaphorically, but literally the division in their relationship. In reality, he's just talking to this stuffed bear that she used to carry around. This is when the story reveals that she died. Horo is so overcome with grief that he tries to kill himself by jumping off the dam. Holy moly, this is so good. Chapter 3 of Zero. I'm not a dragon, it's just raining. I'm a famous. As far as the other stories go, they range from okay to pretty good, each developing a different character, managing to match both their character at the start of the series and their core ideals which are explored through the series. We're not going to go through each of them, but Zero does a great job of capturing the heart of each character and stays true to the message of the main series. Jen, yeah, if, if someone's just tuning into the Arnie Donna podcast yeah. for the first time, catch us up on who you are. Okay, well, <laughs> I am... To catch everyone up on the world post-sequel time skip, this is where the spoilers begin. That's your last warning. So, after Hal revived everyone, most of the characters have split to go and fulfill Hal's last demand to change the world. Ren and Jean got married and had a son named Min. Likewise for Yo and Anna, they had a son named Hana. Both kids we saw in the Shaman King epilogue. Yo and Anna have spent most of their time overseas working to change the world for the better. Tameo and Ryu now run Funbari Inn and raise Hana with the help of the Hanagumi sisters. Ren's become a businessman to fund world change, Horo has become a farmer, Lysurg we don't actually know that much about, and Choco is presumably still in prison, though we don't actually have any confirmation on that yet. Then, this is the inciting incident of most of the sequel drama. Iron Maiden Jean gets murdered. The second major reveal of the sequels is that there's going to be another sort of shaman fight, the Flower of Maze. 
To summarize, despite becoming Shaman King, Hal can't do whatever he wants. The previous eight Shaman Kings, known as the G8, don't like what Hal's up to. To make these big decisions, Hal needs a majority of the G8 to say that's okay. He doesn't have this. The gods can't fight each other without blowing up the world, so they get to make a team to fight on their behalf to decide what happens with the world. The sequels follow this reveal and how the different gods are scheming and planning their teams, particularly Yabisu, who is the previous Shaman King. This is the state of the world at the start of the sequel series. Marco follows Reihard on his quest to find Marco after the death of Jean. After the mainline series, Marco told the x to live their own lives before driving off into the sunset. He's been gone ever since, not even returning for Jean's wedding. Reihard feels like something must be wrong, so begins the journey to track him down. First clue being to find Luchist, which leads him to Peyote and Larch in cartel-run areas in South America. This begins the journey and is about as far as I've read. One of the key pulls of the series comes from Lyserg actually saying that they shouldn't find Marco, to the point that he's pulling the spirit of fire on his allies. It seems he's worried that Marco, learning about Jean's death, will go on a crusade murdering all of those responsible. Remember that Jean isn't really anything special, rather that Marco built her up to be this messianic figure for the x to follow. So presumably, he's going to feel responsible for her death, and this is one of the central question marks that the series is exploring. There's some really great new spirit designs in this series with Santa Muerta and also an exploration of violence in the world. The series starting by looking through the lens of cartels in South America. One of the big themes in all of the sequels is war. Marco's exploring that with gang violence and government intervention. As always with Takei's writing though, the focus is on the main characters, Reihard, Teruko, Peyote, Larch, being those who we've spent the most time with so far. It's really interesting, definitely hoping for some more here. It's still too early in this series to see if it'll be something great, but it's definitely an engaging start. Letting some characters who didn't get a chance to do much in the main series have some more time in the limelight. Cause I'm about to go into that room next door to your daughter and I'm gonna bash her brains out. And then I'm gonna find your two sons. This is a Dune story and it's brutal. The story follows her journey in the final war of the Tau. A branch family of the main house are rising up against the Tau family. This group is known as Red Crimson and were involved in the murder of Jean. Dune is on an absolute crusade against them, defying Ren's edict of breaking the chains of hatred. We haven't seen Ren in this story yet, following only Dune and Horo who shows up looking for Ren. So we don't see Ren's reaction to the death of his wife, at least not yet. The focus is on developing this group known as Red Crimson and watching this war between them and the Tau develop. This story also deals with June's relationship with Pai Long. They are not a couple, but oh, they're absolutely a couple. June gets the chance to really shine in this series. She's shooting people with bazookas. She's killing swarms of people. She's dressing up and breaking down. This series makes it a great time to be a June fan. Again, in this series, we get to see the idea of war being developed. In this case, Red Crimson, who are built up as essentially a spec ops unit against the wealth and splendor of the Tau family. The series gets to play around with the big budget toys, helicopters, bazookas, skyscrapers, very wealthy society things. This contrasts the other series, which generally deal more with people who have a lot less financial power. Why this is important is because, as we'll see in Flowers, wealth and capitalism society models are starting to be challenged and it becomes a central theme. Jun and the Tao are the only heroes we have who actually are wealthy, so following their story is going to be really engaging. This is the series that covers the murder of Iron Maiden Jean, and if you haven't read it, you're probably screaming asking how it happened, so here goes. A member of Red Crimson alongside Yosuke and this young girl, who will soon be known as the Black Maiden, catch Jean alone at home. Yosuke is one of the main villains in Flowers and has some pretty crazy powers. They push the Black Maiden to kill Jean. Jean, realizing that the Black Maiden will be killed or worse by Yosuke, opts to let Shamash take her own life before the young girl's hands get as bloody as her own. She notes all of the people that she killed in the Shaman fight and allows Shamash to enact justice on her, the death penalty. Before Shamash can take the swing, Yosuke stops time, pulling the trigger in the Black Maiden's hand and inserting memories that she killed Jean before Shamash could. When time unpauses, the Black Maiden has shot and killed Jean. What's interesting is that Jean doesn't get revived. In this series, it makes out that it's Ren and Jean's will not to revive her, which hasn't been fully developed why yet. 
In Marco's, it seems more that something is stopping her resurrection related to the Flower of Maze. In Flowers, it seems that the Black Maiden has managed to twist Jean's spirit to become her guardian spirit. Either way, it seems for right now, we won't get any more Jean through the sequels. Red Crimson is again a really interesting premise using some side characters, June in this case, and developing the sequel world of Shaman King beyond the mainline sequels. Besides exploring June's character more, I'm finding the biggest pull to the series is finding out how Red Crimson threw in with Yosuke, and how will the series explore the society changes that Flowers begins. It's in a unique position to see that from the side of a wealthy family. Also finally seeing Ren show up and his reaction to those who killed his wife, and his reaction to his family engaging in this war behind his back, I'm just really excited. Hopefully these are all picked up as Red Crimson continues. When am I supposed to blossom? When am I supposed to blossom? Shaman King Flowers is the direct sequel series of Shaman King. The story ends a bit prematurely. I didn't expect you to come so quickly. Charles Carmichael always comes quickly and is picked up in The Superstar. Personally, I see both Flowers and The Superstar as one story in continuity, only broken up into two stories because of publishing. I think these sequels are both really strong with a lot of potential. There are some amazing ideas and brilliant things in these sequels, however there's also some questionable choices which will turn some people off. To make it easy to talk about, there's basically three stories that Flowers tells. Firstly is setting up the characters and the world, secondly is setting up the Flower of Maze, thirdly is Death Zero. Our main character is Hana Asakura. He's inherited Aminamaru, crazy shaman power, and none of his father's chill. Hana has a massive dad complex and wants to become strong enough to defeat his father. One day, he's confronted by some new faces. A branch family of the main house are rising up against the Asakura family. Hang on, haven't we done this already? Anyways, these guys are the direct descendants of the original Hao and want to take back the Asakura line. This is Yohane and Luca, who get absolutely destroyed by Hana's apparent fiance, Illumi, when they come to try to take Hana. Yohane and Luca still hang around Hana, keeping the peace for the time being. It looks like there is someone pulling the strings from behind though. Enter Yosuke, one of, if not the major antagonist of the sequels. Yosuke is team leader of Team Yabisu and is surprisingly not a shaman. This creepy pyramid thing is his spirit Yabisu, named after the previous shaman king of the same name. Yosuke brainwashes Luka and manipulates Nu Ryu into killing Hana and is pretty successful. He turns Amidamaru's spirit into stone and makes off with him, also learning that Hana has sort of inherited his mother's power of summoning Onis. We say sort of because it wasn't inherited at all. Hana has died before and as payment for the resurrection, how filled baby Hana full of powerful Onis that will spawn whenever his life's in danger. It was all for preparing young Hana for the upcoming Flower of Maze. Next is Gako, who's totally not the new Horo Horo. He's part of Team Howe in the Flower of Maze, and this is where we finally learn what the heck this Flower of Maze is. The previous Shaman Kings and Howe are having a disagreement which needs to be settled via combat. Each god gets to make a team and they will proxy fight on their god's behalf. Well, not having started yet, the teams are scheming to disrupt the other god's plans, hopefully to give themselves the advantage. Hana is going to be team leader and Illumi team manager in the upcoming fight as Team Hal. The other team captains are going to be Yohane and the young Tao Men, who is currently the powerhouse of the team. Men's entering the tournament to help his mother, though we don't actually know what that entails yet. What we do know is that he doesn't want Hana as leader of the team, and upon travelling to Tokyo, straight up kills Hana in their first meeting. Waking up in the Great Spirit, Hao summons a copy of Young Yo for Hana to fight. Of course, Yo stomps house and Hana is forced onto a spiritual quest of sorts. He's sent to this island society in the Great Spirit and meets Lieutenant Sakurai, a Japanese Zero pilot, kamikaze fighter, and soon to be Hana's guardian spirit. Meanwhile, the new team Hao are attacked by the Black Maiden and Golem. The Black Maiden claims to have taken Jean as her guardian spirit, and it seems like it's true. Redzib and Seiram have also thrown in with Team Yabisu. Tameo comes back just in time to stop an all-out war. Taking tea, Redzib and Seiram ask Team Hao to retire from the flower, as they apparently stand no chance of victory. Back in the Great Spirit, somehow Yosuke has found his way into the biome in the hopes to recruit Hana. Hot-tempered as ever, Hana gets into a fight with him and gets put down hard. Sakurai then comes forward and blows the head off Yosuke in the most brutal way. The series goes on to explore Sakurai's character and Hana questioning what it is he fights for, ending with the realization of what he's missing, what he's on this journey for. It's love. 
So if it wasn't clear from the previous synopsis, Flowers pulls a lot from the original series, and I mean a lot. We have new Yo, Ren, Horo, Ryu, Anna, the Lysu Choco, the early Yo Ren fight, the sister attempting revenge for her brother, Ryu learning how to see spirits, the new tournament for the fate of the world. Personally, I find it goes past the point of a callback and is really just retreating the same ground. This whole first third of Flowers just feels like a rehash of the original, which I don't think is a good staging ground for this story. A strong sequel needs to balance bringing in familiar elements I, I understood that reference. with progressing forward into new territory. We don't need to redo Shaman King, that's what we have Shaman King for. Once we get past those familiar elements, the story gets so much stronger. There's a new villain who works on nearly a different power system to the rest of the characters. There's Hana's quest for his own spirit and introspection. There's the beginning of interesting commentary on how society structure, and it's these areas that Flowers begins its own story. There is a lot to talk about in Flowers, but we'll save that for after. Start, start, bazooka. Start, start, start. Cause you're my start, start. Start, I haven't read too much into Superstar, so this synopsis will be quite brief. Superstar picks up where Flowers left off, by following Alumi in a quest to uncover Sakurai's grudge. It's related to the safe that's being protected by this rich old dude. Hana returns as a ghost to help her out, and they cause some ruckus together. It looks like Hana's training and the great spirit went well, because he's back and better than ever. After opening the safe, a group of soldiers' spirits release and threaten Alumi. This is when she Hyogatai's Hana's spirit. And that's as far as I've gotten. Is Anna dead? It's such an inconvenient place to have to stop. Shaman can Hyogatai spirits of the dead to use their skill set, which is exactly what Illumi's doing here. So has Anna died? We know she and Yo died early on in Hana's life, which was discussed in Flowers. We've seen Yo hanging out with Hao and the Great Spirit, so they're probably still dead? In Flowers, Anna asks for a revive for everyone, not just Hana. And as it's written, it seems like they all went back. So we don't really know what's going on yet with Yo and Anna, but it seems like they're both currently dead. To the point I've read, Superstar hasn't quite hit its stride yet. It's still too early days to take a good look into this series. It does pick up on the ideas in Flowers and continues where it left off, giving us another look at Yosuke, the patch village slaughter, and continuing the war intrigue that Death Zero introduced. As far as a dive into the story's ideas go, these chapters of Superstar don't add too much to that discussion, so let's slice Superstar here and talk about those ideas that the sequels are exploring. We're going to need details. Copious details. I think the two big ideas that the sequels are looking to explore are the dark side of humanity through the lens of war, and how societies should organise themselves. The former relates to how's final command to change the world. As far as the sequels go, this has been seen through the Cartel Wars in Marcos, The Last Tower War in Red Crimson, Death Zero in Flowers, Sakurai Safe in Superstar, how talks to Yo in The Great Spirit about the wars raging on in the world, and how humans continue to burn the world down. They talk about all the soldiers who died in war. What did they achieve? Would they like the world as it is now? This leads into the second idea of societal structure. The main villain is basically capitalism personified. Prior Shaman King Yabisu set up the current structure of the world, and the mangas tie it to these growing cities, wealth, etc. Nowhere more clearly is this seen than the other main villain Yosuke, so let's go and talk about the main characters. Hana is a strong contrast to Yo. He's hot-headed, quick to jump into a fight, and doesn't really care for the people around him. He's not happy with the current state of the world, which puts him in a prime position to compete in the Flower of Maze. He's had Amidamaru as a guardian spirit for so long, he's begun to think himself invincible. Which is why it's so damaging to lose him to Yosuke. It's his journey in the Great Spirit with Sakurai that challenges Hana on his character. When he returns in Superstar, he comes back a much more level-headed kid. One of the things that Hana is dealing with is that he has missing memories, most likely caused by Yosuke deleting memories from his mind. Memories relating to meeting Alumi and the slaughter of the Patch Village. Alumi is the daughter of Silver and has inherited his five animal spirits. She gets this power armor over soul style and has the skills to back it up too. She's been raised by Anna to be a powerful successor to her and fiance to Hana. I really like her character and her character design, but I gotta say, I hate this tooth thing. It's such a personal peeve and it always just reminds me that these characters aren't real people. Especially when they get these kinds of poses. What was that? I know these streets better than anyone. Huh? Alumi seems to know more about Hana's past. Her memory was not altered. As the new Anna, she looks like she's gonna fit the role well. 
If Hal was the big bad with the immense powers to back it up, Yosuke is the sneaky schemer who generally keeps to the shadows behind his goons. Despite having his head blown off by Sakurai, he's definitely still alive. There's just something really unsettling about Yosuke, and the characters in the series agree. He was involved in the Patch Village slaughter, is currently leading Team Yabisu, steals Midamaru, and has some weird abilities with that spirit Yabisu. What is he? Yabisu is a unique spirit, to the point that it works almost on a different power system than the rest of Shaman King. He's like Golem, a machine-spirit hybrid. See, Yabisu exchanges money for cards of Shaman power. For example, Yosuke can just buy an oversoul of a certain power. He also can do some special abilities. From what we've seen so far in the series, he can stop time, manipulate memories, and calcify spirits, making them worthless. These are all new to the series and are honestly terrifying. Using Yabisu, Yosuke has already managed to manipulate the Black Maiden and Luka into doing what he wants, and now he has his eyes set on converting Hana to his side, something which he has now tried once and failed, though with Yabisu's power, it does not seem impossible. The Yabisu spirit sums up Yabisu the god. It represents the current society where with enough money, you can really do whatever you want, equating money with power. Hey. Ah! Now take that weedy miscreant! It's telling that the spirit itself is an eye of providence, a representation commonly seen on the American dollar bill. This is the state of the world that Team Yabisu are looking to ensure survival of, so the manga gets this very heavy socio-political aspect pulled into it. From the early chapters, it looks like the sequels will either intentionally or unintentionally have this anti-capitalist message put into it. I for one really like this. Most Shaman King fans would have picked up the original years ago and are now of the age to start looking at the world in a deeper context. Regardless of any personal opinions on how the world should be, it becomes so engaging to see where Takei is going to take this. He's created villains out of an ideology rather than just a character. For some people, I can imagine this is a massive turnoff, but I think seeing how heavy ideas are represented, even if you don't agree with them, is so interesting. Themey stuff aside, there's a lot of juicy plot that's left open at the moment. What happened at the slaughter of the Patches? Why doesn't Hana remember? Where's Ren and Yo and Anna? Why did Red Seb and Seiram switch sides? Why has Hao chosen the kids as his team rather than the elemental warriors? What are the other gods up to? Hao presumably met Yabisu in the previous shaman fight, so what's their relationship? Is Jesus going to be in this manga as another antagonist? Did he win a shaman fight? Oh wow, okay, someone actually wrote this as a fan fiction. Uh, if you're interested, there'll be a link in the description. One of the points that comes up just often enough to be foreshadowing is that of, stay with me, aliens. More than once, Rutherford is brought up and the power of Grey Saucer. Even in the name Flower of Maze is reminiscent of a crop circle, though that might be a bit of a stretch. It definitely seems like there's going to be some extraterrestrial aspect going on in the sequels somewhere down the line. There's a lot of loose threads currently that leave me really engaged in the Shaman sequels, and I'm really excited to see where they're going. No, 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 no. Now, it wouldn't be fair to look at a sequel without discussing some of the issues. There's two big issues that I find plague sequel series, power scaling and undermining the source material. These really go hand in hand. Power scaling forcing characters to be stronger and better than what was seen in the original, and new ideas undermining the strength or the achievements of the original. A great example of both of these is the Star Wars sequels. Rey and Kylo needed bigger and stronger force powers than the sequels. Anakin's sacrifice in Return of the Jedi was undermined by Palpatine not really being dead after all. Power scaling is a weird thing, and you either care about it or not at all. The concerns for Shaman King is that none of the original cast are being chosen for the Flower of Maze. The new characters are presumably intended to grow so much stronger than them. I don't think this is a huge issue, because even in the original, it was discussed that it's the kids who have the potential to hit higher heights than the adults got to. The concern comes in by introducing new powerful shamans who were around the whole time but just didn't come to the shaman fight. The original built up the shaman fight as the best of the best, shamans from all around the globe competing to become god. If you introduce hosts of new shaman who can go toe to toe with the best, you have to introduce reasons why they didn't attend the shaman fight. Scaling is normally used as that way to keep tension going. You can't have Ren just come in with the Spirit of Thunder and outpower every character in the sequels, but you also can't have a lot of new characters going up against the Shaman Fight champions with spirits comparable to the elemental spirits, so there is a big risk of trivialising the strength of the original cast. 
This leads straight into undermining the original. The main concern, and I imagine this is already pissing people off, is that Hal can't wipe the world clean even if he wanted to. There's an urgency in the original because the idea was if Hal became Shaman King, the world is doomed. But now with the sequels, that was never the case. Even if Yoan Pals failed to redeem Hal, they could have had a second chance in the Flower of Maze. It weakens Hal's role as the Shaman King, he's unable to make these big choices without first winning another tournament. Besides that, I think that the sequels have been respectful to the original series. If you're a massive Gene fan, you might disagree, but so far the sequels have done a good job of acknowledging the characters of the original series and their achievements. Hopefully, that will continue as the sequels do. Very well. Much like a present given to my special boy, this meeting is wrapped. So, should you read them? Yes, yes, Go and read all of yes. them. Here is a cheeky reading order for you, which will hopefully make a bit more sense. Go Zero first, then Red Crimson, Marcos, Flowers, and finish with Superstar. They're all surprisingly great content, and potentially some of the best parts of Shaman King as a whole. If you can only get stuck into one, I'd go Flowers. The start is a bit shaky and will feel all too familiar in the start, but by the time you get to Death Zero, you won't be able to put it down. Heck, this turned out to be a long video. There's honestly so much more packed inside these sequels that hopefully we can get into once Superstar's a bit further along. For the time being though, I'm putting Shaman King to bed. Maybe picking it back up around April when the anime comes out. If you're a Pokemon fan... Hey, I know! I'll use my trusty frying pan as a drying pan! That's going to be the next video. There's this amazing series which is genuinely some of the best Pokemon content I've seen and I want to talk about it. If you've got some other good series to read, please let me know too. I'm currently looking for some new reading material and I've really enjoyed some of the recommendations that have been suggested already. Thank you for joining me on the Shaman King journey and thank you for watching. This has been CG and I'll see you G's in the next one.